to be learning so much about the issues of concern to all of us gathered in this room. And I think it's only appropriate to start, because I haven't had a chance to do so, by offering my condolences to all victims of Iranian government violence and terrorism, and particularly to the victims in Camp Ashraf and their families here today. I like to think, because I served for uh, six years as the Senior Foreign Policy Advisor to Senator George Mitchell on the Hill, that I have a, a good appreciation for the, uh, the politics of, of international challenges, about the issues of democracy in Iran, about the issues of human rights in Iran, is that, thank you, is that often for the United States, we see a significant conflict in our foreign policy between the values that America has held dear and indeed was founded upon and the interests of the United States of America as it plots its foreign policy and manages the affairs of state. And what is extraordinary about this set of issues is that in very important ways, values and interests are joined in a common framework for approaching the questions of Iran and democracy and human rights. So this clash that I often teach about in the conduct of foreign policy, which so often leads to inconsistency, to uh, reversals of fortune, to charges of hypocrisy, actually has an opportunity to be reconciled in the context of the issues that we're talking about today. Now, this is in many ways the biggest strength that this community, that the community gathered here today, has as it seeks to galvanize action and draw attention to the very significant challenges in U.S. foreign policy. But it doesn't mean that the practical path is necessarily simple or easy. In that context, I think it's very important for us to remember when we talk about the issues that motivate us that the United States is in a period in which it is really begun to look inward. And so the country comes to this discussion from a perspective of wariness about regime change arguments, wariness about the use of military power, wariness about supporting allies just a little bit in the fear that that commitment will creep over time. And we have to be cognizant of that as we think about urging the United States to do the right thing in this context. And in that vein, I want to talk about two broad issue areas. I want to first talk about the problem of Iran, and then I want to talk about the humanitarian challenge with Camp Ashraf. And as I said, you know, the interesting opportunity that we have that I think falls on very fertile soil in the American political debate is that there is no disagreement about the nature of the Iranian regime. It is abhorrent. And it is not simply abhorrent from a values perspective in terms of the gross violations of human rights and the authoritarian nature of the rule, but it is a real threat to American security, to the security of many of our friends, and to international peace and stability. So there's strong agreement on that fact, but there are also many regimes that fall into a similar category of being abhorrent and being threats to international peace and security. And simply because we can identify a regime as a problem doesn't easily suggest the right and most effective solution to that problem. So one of the caveats that I want to offer as we think about a future free Iran, a future democratic Iran, is that when you look historically at the US experience with regime change, we have many, many, many different models. We have the model of the Cold War, in which the United States chose to deter and chose to poke and prod through proxies and waited and waited and waited and waited. And waited. If you think about the political context in which Ambassador Reese worked, where um, in Northern Ireland we had a long-standing conflict that had political and military dimensions in which the United States diaspora community played a significant role 
Um, that also took a long time and led to a negotiated solution. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, in the context of forcible regime change, very uncertain results. Um, the United States, I think, in both Afghanistan and Iraq has learned that, um, that war often has many unintended consequences. And that so one of the challenges for this community and for us all going forward is to help think creatively about what I have heard this community describe as the third way. So one of the challenges is to flesh that out and to explain in greater detail second and third order consequences, the specifics of how you would achieve it, the, the groundwork for moving forward in, in this alternative that reflects where Washington is today and offers a pragmatic and hopeful future for your movement, your cause, and for Iranians in the country and worldwide. But secondly, I, I think the humanitarian issues are ones in which there is broad consensus. And again, not a simple set of solutions. And so the academic in me that seeks consistency and seeks to look at the long-term benefits of different courses of action cautions us to not downplay the complexities uh, that you all live and breathe vis-a-vis -vis Camp Ashraf. But at base, it's very, very simple. And this is, I think, the strongest point to move forward at this moment, because we are at risk of an extraordinary humanitarian crisis by the end of this year, unless we are able to rally the international community to step up to the plate. And here I do think the United States bears a special responsibility. I do not think that we can, um, regardless of the legality, hide behind Iranian sovereignty to escape the moral obligation that comes from the history that we have had with Camp Ashraf. That is a, a significant um, concern. And the cold-blooded murder of unarmed people is wrong no matter where it happens and no matter who commits it. It is simply wrong. It is uh, anti-democratic. It is anti-American. It is against international law. It is wrong. And so that piece is very, very simple. Now, a lot of my work has been on preventing mass atrocity. Mass atrocity is the slaughter of unarmed civilians. That is what has happened in Camp Ashraf. And it is wrong. <laughs> commend to you a small book on mass atrocity response operations that I put together with some colleagues from the U.S. Peacekeeping Institute. It's available on the web, but it talks about the challenges of responding to mass atrocity. And here, I think, is a place for us to roll up our sleeves and dig in. This is a very powerful tool for focusing attention and for galvanizing resources and commitment. And I think it is a place that the Camp Ashraf impending crisis cries out for analysis. And I would urge you to spend some time trying to think in very concrete terms about what would be, be required in the event that a political solution is not attained beforehand. So I guess it, uh, what I would like to say in, in conclusion is that I do see a very special American responsibility to ensure the safety of those in Camp Ashraf until their final status is determined. And clearly, it needs to be a priority to determine that final status, to work not simply with our erstwhile allies, the Iraqi government, which has been perpetrating these crimes, but also with our European friends and the international community. Because sovereignty is an important value, but it's not the only value. And the practice of foreign policy is about reconciling competing values. And here, in the case of our interests and our humanitarian values, we have a very clear call to action to focus attention on this and do it now. And if values and interests, when combined, are the most powerful call to action, you have an extraordinary narrative to tell. It needs to be explained in a way that can be heard in the context of a, a town and a country that is dealing with many challenges. But you have 
you have humanitarian arguments on your side, you have values on your side, and they, they call for action in the context of very clear American interests in ultimately changing the nature of Iranian governance to allow for democracy and freedom for the Iranian people. And so I look forward to continuing the dialogue with you about, practically speaking, how we might do that. Thank you very much. We've heard eloquent testimony from each of our speakers as to why it's in America's national security interests to support the residents of Camp Ashraf and to delist the MEK. The MEK opposes a regime that is responsible for the deaths of American soldiers. The MEK opposes a regime that has acted and that continues to act to destabilize and dominate the region, including acting as the world's leading state sponsor of terror. So yes, we do have important national security interests involved in this issue. But there's more at stake here than just American interests. American values are at stake as well. We have given our solemn word that we would protect the people of Camp Ashraf. The protection of these defenseless civilians is a fundamental human right. This is a principle that the United States has long championed all over the world. Our voice, our efforts, our values to promote human rights cannot stop at the gates of Camp Ashraf. The fight being waged to delist the MEK, the fight to protect the residents of Camp Ashraf, this fight is not their fight alone. It's not your fight alone. It is America's fight as well. Both our interests and our values are inextricably linked in this case. To the residents of Camp Ashraf, we stand with you. We will continue to work to change U.S. policy and we will not rest until we succeed. Thank you very much.